Welcome to the Hero Front Podcast, the 2022 Veteran Podcast of the Year winner. I'm your host, Josh White, and I talk with heroes around the world to inspire, educate, and to remind you that you are not alone. My own personal journey was marked by struggles like depression and alcoholism, which led me to almost lose my life. Now, after years of working on myself, I'm now blessed to say I have an abundance of pride and purpose, and I have made it my mission to share and spread these lessons by having insightful interviews with inspiring individuals, emphasizing trust, transparency, and meaningful conversation to drive positive action in our lives. Above all, I aim to inspire you to unleash your inner hero. We all have it in us, and it's time to bring it to the front lines of our lives. Let's get after it. All right, welcome to Hero Front, the podcast where we uncover stories of leadership, resilience, and heroism in the Air Force and beyond. I'm your host, Josh White, and today we have the honor of sitting down with Chief Master Sergeant Brent Chaddock, who goes by CHIP as his call sign, which you heard earlier why, an exemplary leader whose journey from rural Arkansas to the apex of the Air Force has been nothing short of inspiring. Chief Chaddock's career spends over two decades of dedicated service from his humble beginnings as a farm kid to his current role as an instructor at the Chief Master Sergeant Leadership Academy, Maxwell Air Force Base, Gunter Annex, Alabama, with responsibilities that include shaping the next generation of strategic level leaders, Chief Chaddock embodies the principles of leadership, mentorship, and perpetual development. Throughout his illustrious career, Chief Chaddock has served in various capacities, from security forces duties to senior leadership roles, including a pivotal command chief assignment in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. His deployments and contributions to critical combat operations underscore his unwavering commitment to service and excellence. Dive into Chief Chaddock's insights on emotional intelligence and emotional regulation, leading from neutral and perpetual development as he shares wisdom gained from his diverse experiences and leadership journey. And that is like, what is your go-to TV show or movie that you just love forever. Like it never gets old. You're going to rewatch it again at some point in your life. Oh, any of the Indiana Jones. Oh, definitely. Indy, any of them, any of them. When I was a young boy, I always wanted to be Indiana Jones. And, uh, you know, I ended up with one of those Federos and, and then my dad bought me a bullwhip and I thought I was the guy, right? So. Uh, any of those Indiana Jones films, uh, I can I can watch any of them. I can start anywhere in the middle of them, and and finish it every time. And I won't I won't flinch. Yeah, he that I mean, I just kind of rewatched a lot of those recently. I have watched a bunch of old movies recently, and, and there's a few that surprised me. Like Indiana Jones, amazing. I knew that was amazing. Like I watched that since I was a kid. Um, he, you know, he's such a he kind of reminds me of James Bond. Like there's nothing he's bad at. Like he's He's like a scientist, a scholar, a teacher. He can fly planes. You know, yeah. he can think on his feet. He's athletic. Like he just has all these qualities except for snakes, that make bro. right snakes. <laughs> except for snake. That's right. My dad's the same way. I don't do snakes. He doesn't do snakes. So, yeah, my dad's the same way. He brought that up countless times in my childhood but um the the one the movie that surprised me recently that i rewatched that was like really good was sister act one and two really? i just i just had the inclination to rewatch it i haven't seen it since i was little it's actually a really good movie um i, I rewatched that i rewatched homeward bound with the dogs get, trying to get home sure. um and i rewatched 10 things i hate about you and yeah i mean they just made movies like you know, really good. Like some of them are better than I remembered going back and rewatching. There's a lot of nostalgia of that time. Um, but yeah, there's just so many good oldies out there that we just haven't seen in forever. Um, so every so often when I have time, you know, I try to rewatch them, but Indiana Jones is a, a perfect timeless classic answer. So I think that's awesome. All right. Second question is who was the biggest mentor that you've ever had in your life that that got you here today to the man that I'm looking at right now that was key to that mm. I, I really I've really been blessed 
uh, I've had a lot of great mentors. Um, I mean, even to this day, um, but probably the guy that set the foundation for me was a guy named Philip D. Bennett at Columbus, Mississippi. He was a new master sergeant to that location, and then I had returned from a deployment. And he met me at the airport when I returned from the deployment. And uh, he said, hey, you're coming to work for me. All I've heard about is you, you, you. So I figured I needed to get you on my team. And uh, he was the guy. Um, you know, and then there was a guy named Chuck Doodlehauser and the guy that gave me my nickname, Mac Bill McIntyre. I've had some Absolutely. Really great commanders. I mean, I just, Josh, I really had a lot of phenomenal influences in my life. So, uh, uh, but those would be my top three. That too. That's awesome. Do you, would you say they saw the best in you? Like what, what? Oh man, they, they saw the worst in me and still turn me around to bring the best out of me. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. Cause sometimes you see, you meet people that see the worst in you and they just want nothing to do with you. They just give up. Um, I think the better leaders are the ones that, you know, can make that change in you can point that out without, you know, giving you a meltdown. They can do it like in their own special way to have you want to make the change on your own, kind of like a Jedi mind trick. Well, isn't that the art of, uh, influencing and directing people i mean i can't make you change i have to get you to want to change you know if, if i'm um you know it's the 12-step program you know if i'm using drugs or alcohol or something like that or even if i'm trying to quit cursing or whatever i'm trying to do i have to have that inner desire to change there has to be the intrinsic motivation to try to get there um, but to have somebody that can tap into that and get you to believe more in yourself, to increase your level of motivation, and to see almost they mirror the better version of you that you're trying to become, that's that's true leadership, in my opinion. Absolutely. That's beautiful. All right, third question. It's going to be a little deep on this one. Deep. All oh, right. Let's it's going to be a little deep. Has there ever been a time in your life that, you know, you almost quit? You almost gave up on yourself. Um, very difficult time, but you found a way to get through it, and you're a better person for it. Does anything come to mind? Well, I've got, um, I've got at least three or four of those moments. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been, I feel like I've been to the abyss. I mean, and just really wanted to just kind of back fall into that and just plunge into it and just not ever turn around. And I think the uh, those moments, those moments that I was there, it's it's been my kids, you know, that's kind of made me straighten my tail up uh, a little bit of that that small inner voice in my head, you know, I, that, that has made me, you know, say, Hey, don't, don't take that next big step to hurt yourself or harm yourself or go to a place that is unrecoverable. So it, it's, it's been the internal voice and the and thought of my kids that have popped into my head those three or four times that have, uh, made me realize that that's not the path I'm going to go down. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And yeah, your kids can, I mean, I have two kids and they're like, they're like little miracles. You know what I mean? I mean, they're just, they make you see the world differently. They make you, you know, see where you need to improve on your life. Like they tell you the, the honest truth that no one else will tell you except maybe your wife. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you're just, you're just better for it. Um, I love being a dad. And so I could definitely see that being something that kind of pulls you out of that, that darkness. And wait, wait till your kids hit that teenage year. You think they, they're honest and uh, forthright and they deliver candor. Hmm. They will deliver some unvarnished problems that you have that you have, you have tried to bury. And they'll remind you of it at the least opportune time, typically in the 
I found in the space of um, they've created an infraction or they violated one of the rules and then now you're about to discipline and they're like, well, you and boy, that's a that's a good piece of crow to eat right there. Absolutely. My daughter's sick. She's already smarter than me. So I'm I better shape up because she's she already is. She's just so smart. Like she's so emotionally intelligent. Um, she, I, I just feel like she's this gifted little girl. My son, he's, you know, boys are a little slower. They're a little more carefree. At least that's what I've been told. Um, so my little boy is more just makes us laugh. Very funny. Always goofing around. But my daughter is just already such a deep person. I'm like, wow, what is she going to be when she grows up? You know, what, how is she going to turn out? But she's already so candid and honest with me. Um, when, by the time she's a teenager, I better have my stuff together. That's all I'm saying. Well, I, I would probably argue that you already have your stuff together. Uh, Stanford University did a study that said that 89% of what we learn as humans, we learn by watching. 10% of what we learn, we learn by hearing, and the other 1% is through the other senses. So um, I would offer you for consideration that your daughter's been watching you and your wife, and she, that's how she's picked up on that emotional intelligence, emotional regulation, and how to deal with people and adults. And your your son or the youngest child syndrome, so to speak, he's just he's just watching everything play out. But he's he's tuned in, but he can still be his own person because he can watch everything kind of bump and grind, and it's not at his expense. Right, absolutely. Yeah, he sometimes he points out or says something that really catches us off guard. We're like, well, he he's no he's on to us a little more than he's yeah absolutely. he's letting us know. <laughs> He's taking notes, brother. I promise He's taking you. notes. Yeah. Um, yesterday, I put my second pet down. I don't know if you saw that on Facebook or not, but I'm so sorry. I appreciate it. Um, I had two Yorkies. I have really bad allergies with pets. And I, when I was in Missouri, I heard that, you know, that's one of the breeds that typically people aren't allergic to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just great, smart dogs to have. And they don't shed or anything. So I bought one. Um, when I was a senior airman in Missouri, just got there. That's like when I was at the lowest point of my life. When I is by the time when I went to Whiteman, this was like 2009. Um, I was drinking every day. I got to a new place where I didn't know anyone, so it was just much easier to isolate. Um, and that dog really helped me. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, it just kind of stumbled upon me. Like this couple was moving. They heard that I wanted a dog. It was a dog I wasn't allergic to, so I took it. Um, and I feel like we saved each other cause he was in a bad household. You know, he's like six months old, but getting like hit and smacked and stuff apparently. So, you know, we kind of saved each other. Um, yeah. and then when I met my wife, you know, I wanted my dog to have a companion. And so I got her a Yorkie. And so then my two dogs were basically like brother and sister yeah. and they've been our first children in a sense, right? Like they, sure. we treated them just like children. Like we, we dressed them up. We took them everywhere. They've been to, they've hiked Moab, Sedona, Flagstaff. They've been on the Vegas Strip, Grand Canyon, um, the Hoover Dam, um, Dog Beach, San Diego. Like we took them everywhere. They've done everything. Like they're, they've just lived a wonderful life. Um, and then we suddenly lost Pebbles three months ago. The, the one I gifted my wife. And that was really sudden, like it just happened. And then my other dog started going downhill, like right after that. So for the past like two, three months, his health issues just started getting real apparent. But, you know, now that we knew what was going to happen, we spent this past three months, like treating him like a king, mm -hmm. like just letting him eat. We, we let him have a whole plate of food at the dinner table, giving him ice cream, like taking him to the beach and just letting him like sit, you know, and watch the ocean. Yeah. Um, and then yesterday we had to put him down and my daughter was very adamant on going. I wasn't sure if I should take her. So I'm like, I don't know if this is going to like scar her or what, but she's so emotionally intelligent. I was like, you know what? I, I believe her. I think, I think if we don't take her, she'll hold it against us forever. And uh, cause she's been really taking care of him lately. So it was just me and my daughter, you know, at the vet yesterday. Um <laughs> And, you know, it, I told her it, it helped me just as much as it, because she's like, you know, I'm glad, thanks for doing that with me, daddy, you know, it's hard. I was like, you helped me, you know, get through that. Um, but yeah, I, I say all that just to say, you know, children are, are very special and so are pets. I mean, holy cow. They're just the most wonderful dogs are just some of the most wonderful animals on planet earth.
Well, I, I totally agree with you, Josh, but think about that life lesson you just shared with your daughter at, at her, at her beckoning. She's asking you to go and you said yes. So how many of our coworkers are asking to go with us and we're not taking them on the journey? So you right. took your daughter on a journey, a mature journey, but you took her and you gave her a chance to kind of feel that out at her level, at her her maturity that she is developing by watching you and your wife. And um, and I applaud you, man. You can't dodge the hard stuff. Right. Our job is that we've been spending too much time preparing the path for the airman and not preparing the airman for the path. We got to prepare, true. prepare the kid and the airman for the, for the path, not the path for them. Yeah, I told, that's what I was talking to my wife about. It's basically like, hey, this is like an unavoidable lesson. Of course. Well, of course. You know, if, if we can do it in a controlled setting, you know, think of how much more resilient and healthy she'll be to get through this later on, you know, instead of just blindsiding her because we avoided it, you know, letting her feel any of those emotions. Sure. So we, we did talk through it. And my, honestly, my daughter is, is much better today. Like she's already, you know, getting through it in a yeah. much healthier way. Yeah. She's made peace with it. Absolutely. Well, we went deep right out the gate. Holy cow. My friend, that's okay. <laughs> that is that is that is quite okay. I am uh, I'm comfortable uh, going zero to emotional real quick. I, I, I can handle that space. You're a chief, so that's what y'all do. I, no, I I would submit to you that it's not it's not tied to the rank, it's tied to the amount of adversity that you've potentially been through. Uh, like you like you were talking about your daughter, uh, those that have not suffered will not be able to endure the, the the resistance. You have to endure the resistance to go the distance. And and if if we spend more time preparing a path, then people give up. I mean, people give up. They want to claim that they're they they're having uh, uh, anxiety issues when potentially they're not. Uh, they want, to, they want to go to mental health when potentially they don't need to go to mental health. They just need somebody to sit in the sit in their crap with them. And, and but that person that they need to sit in their crap with them, you know, their supervisor or leader, manager, coach is unfamiliar with how to hold that kind of space. So where do we teach that? It's always through demonstration performance and like your daughter's learning right now. That's Definitely. Nice. I appreciate that. All right, so I always end this random questions with this last bonus question. Okay. And this could be something very small. It doesn't have to be grandiose. All right. But when I say what's your proudest Air Force moment, you think back on your career. Is there any moment where something just clicked for you or it was just really special and you just never forgot it? Man, I've got a lot of those moments. I am. Uh... Yeah, probably, probably just being given the opportunity to be a command chief. Um, I mean, because I'd gotten told that day that I hadn't made the roster of the list for command chief selection and that I wouldn't compete. And then later that day, I am uh, kind of full of myself and uh, feeling sorry. And uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm sitting in a meeting and somebody comes and grabs me out of the meeting and tells me my daughter's going into premature labor. And uh, so I have to leave and I'm in Albuquerque and I have to drive to uh, Bossier City Shreveport, to Barksdale. That's where my daughter and my son-in-law are at. And uh, along the way, I, uh, I reach and I pull my, my stripe off my chest and I throw it in the floorboard. And I said, hey, just, just put me where you want me, right? I uh, just make sure my kid is okay and the baby's okay. Well, sure as, sure as heck, uh, you know, the creator has a way and the baby's born two pounds, eight ounces. And uh, I had to stop for the night because I couldn't make the 13-hour drive after working all day. So I stop and I 
stay overnight and I get a phone call the next day. It says, Hey man, you need to call um, general red Walker. He's in Afghanistan. He's looking for you. It's my 06. I was a mission support group chief at the time. And I'm like, why? He said, chief, how's your daughter? And I tell him two pounds, eight ounces. The baby's fine. Emergency C centering. You know, almost lost him. So then I, um, I had always carried my son and daughter's baby sock in my pocket. And then when I got to Barksdale, I started carrying my grand grandson's baby sock. And sure as heck, I call this general and he says, hey, dude, how's your daughter? And I'm like, how could you know about my daughter, sir? He says, just tell me what's going on. I said, preeclampsia, almost lost them both. And, uh, but, you know, through grace and everything and modern technology, we got the baby two pounds, eight ounces, 13 inches long. We're going to be fine. We're going to be a NICU. And he says, all right, dude, well, let's load up and we, let's go to Prince Sultan Air Base and stand up uh, Prince Sultan Air Base. We're going to live in tents. It's going to really suck, but we're going to have a great time because we're going to be together. I said, okay, cool. I said, you need a MSG chief? He goes, no, I want you to be my command chief. I said, boss, I said, I got told just yesterday I'm not on the list. I'm not eligible. He goes, chief, do you want to go? I'd love to go. He said, well, pack your bags. I'll worry about the bureaucracy. And I'm on the side of the road in the middle of Texas, three hours from Shreveport. And I said, okay. Prince Sultan Air Base, it is. That's where I'm going to go. And that was, I'm like, okay, just when you think it's not going to happen, look at how it comes back full circle. And, wow. And it happens. And um, I kind of keep these little things in, in my pocket to keep me a little bit grounded, Josh. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Um, and wow, talk about like the lowest of lows feeling sorry for yourself. Now you're afraid for your kid and your grandchild and, yeah. and then a complete, you know, you, you kind of just, you rip the rank off as like, Hey, like I'm going to stop trying to control everything. I just need to like trust and just go with it and just be where you need me to be. And it's almost like you were rewarded on the spot for that. I mean, Holy cow, you're, your kiddo. Um, she pulls through kiddo. The grandchild goes to the NICU and you get, I mean, what are the chances of that? Then you get this call that you were selected for something you were told was not even going to happen. You're not even on the list. That's I right. mean, that's like a miracle. Dude. And, and then I was told I wasn't going to compete for a next, next assignment for, for another yard. And guess where I got sent? Mark still reference space. No, my daughter's out the back gate, 15 minutes. My son is fi another 15 minutes away. I'm hanging out with my grandson and, you know, trying to tell uh, my son-in-law some dumb dad jokes and he's not laughing because his part of the agreement is that he doesn't laugh. And my part of the agreement is that I laugh at everything. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, what, what could be better? How, who would have, you couldn't have wrote a better story. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. You picked a really good one right there. Holy cow. That was wow. I, you know, I call that God's favor. That's what I learned. It's a term I learned from Chaplain Kim, um, who was part of True North when I was on the Honor Guard team. I, I've struggled my whole career, right? Like so, most of it's self-inflicted. Sure. But I I you you could you should have called me chip. I had multiple chips on my shoulder. I was angry and uh no faith whatsoever in anything. And you know, that that was like the first time in my life where like miracles started happening. Sure. You know, we're not just for me, like for the whole team. Like, I mean, even my scheduler who was like in debt and about to like lose everything gets this call that like the bank made a mistake and like under taxes and they owe her like 20 grand or just like the craziest. I, I know like one after another, after another, it was like, we were gifted with this time. I attribute it to doing our best, like being selfless for these families and for these airmen and <clears throat> really putting it all out there for other people. Sure. I, I really truly feel like we were rewarded for that. Yeah. And when I talked to Chaplain Kim about it, he's like, that's God's favor. I was like, what? what did, I never heard that term until then. 
I'm like, how do I get more of that? That changed my perspective forever. Like when a miracle like that happens, you know what's you know anything's possible. Yeah. Well, that that's a humbling experience, and it lets you know that when you let go, and you just let let the creator do what the creator does, and and um, you just, you have that faith in the system that the system's going to work out and everything's going to shine on you one day, and and because you're not worried about anything else, you're just worried about what really matters what what really matters so. and <clears throat> i also got master sergeant then and in public health it's really hard to get so when i went to honor guard i had more of an opportunity <clears throat> but i had come up short this is like my fourth time which really isn't that bad honestly of course i thought like it was the end of the world um but i finally once i said i'm not going for this anymore like I even told the like our squadron chief that i'm like i'm not you want to promote me great i'm not going for that anymore i'm just going to do my best and as soon as i did that then i got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right um but to i think you need to do things for the right reasons too like so when i self-reflected on that time those three times i came up short what was really driving me was it that i wanted to give back or was it because my buddies from tech school are passing me up and i'm feeling bitter about it or competitive you know i feel like when i approached it at like at that um it just it just wasn't working out because who wants to promote someone like that when they're going for it for those reasons you know and although i wasn't blatantly saying it people pick up on it they can see it they can feel it when someone's just in it for for themselves sure uh for their own ego and that is not a fun path to be on so ever since that point till present day i have always uh approached promotions or awards or any of that by just being selfless and the best i can and if it happens it happens if not oh well have you found more joy in that josh oh absolutely yeah. because it gives you 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 really start to focus on other people and when you turn their life around from i mean like you give them that annual award experience and Suddenly they, they feel loved and seen for the first time and you see what that does to them. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Of course. That's yeah. why I do the podcast. This is my form of gratitude for others. Mm -hmm. That's why I started it. Yeah. yeah. You reminded me of a quote by a guy named Zig Ziglar. He says, you can have anything in the world you want if you help enough people get what they want. Oh, wow. That's I 100% agree which is, with that. Which is all serving others, right? You know, right. Which is our call to uh, where this nation's jersey is to serve others because we're the 1% of serving the 99. Absolutely. And I'll tell you why I wanted you on the podcast. Okay. All right. You just have this contagious personality, like, you know, online, and I met you in person. Um, you, you, there's just something that, like, people are drawn into you. Like you have that energy, but I'll tell you, it's not just that why I wanted you to come on yeah. because you weren't like a blind optimist. You didn't strike me as a blind optimist. You struck me as someone who had to earn where you're at today and that you seem to appreciate it more. I've, um, I've had my series of gutters and strikes and, uh, I have, um, I'm, I'm a self-reformed I always say I'm a self-performed narcissist, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, no longer a self-licking ice cream cone cannibal. Um, and and there, that term never gets old. I mean, think about that. I mean, when, when we tell people to go volunteer, we tell them to go volunteer because it's going to be a good bullet in their 1206 or their EPD. We don't tell them that if you really want to develop a skill of leadership, go lead volunteers because they don't have to follow you, right? They're volunteers. They'll tell you to go pound sand and scratch and, you know, jump off a short pier real quick. Uh, go, go lead a group of your peers because, again, they don't have to follow you because they're your peers. They can tell you right. to go pound sand and hide yourself in the restroom for about 24 hours and never come out. They, they will tell you to go other places, expletives. It, we don't tell a lot of people why. We tell them that the why is so that I can write them a good 1206 and I can get them an award and I can make them promotable. But what if we 
flip that script and instead of making great power competition with the person to our left and right, we started making it an internal dialogue. And so I found more joy like you have in, in helping others and being a, I'm a shameless promoter of other people. When I find that they have had like luck in their life, I introduce them with their story and, and I learn their story uh, and, and I try to promote them and put them on a pedestal every time I can. And it seems to have worked. I love, I mean, I love that about you. I mean, how could you not? Um, it just seems like you just find joy wherever you went. You, you, you saw the person for who they are. You shared their story. You're grabbing pictures with them. Uh, you're very personable, very approachable. Mm. And, well, and I loved all that about you, but I'm, but I'm the one thing that really drew me in the most was that I just had this sense that you had to earn that, that you went through some tough times and you appreciate it now. That, that's the, the vibe that I got was your appreciation for where you're at. I have, um, I don't, I wish I knew who said this, but I have learned that adversity is the garden for relationships. Hmm. And when I find somebody that's suffering and I can sit with them during their time of trouble, it's, there's really an intrinsic reward for me. I get out, I get a lot out of it, but they seem to want to repay you, but there's, you don't have to pay me. We'll pay it forward. Pay it for the next person. You know? mm -hmm. And that that's the thing that I missed. You know, all the great mentors and leaders and uh, coaches and even the tormentors in my life. <laughs> it, learning that ability to hold space for a human is um, it's extremely powerful. It is. And I, I look to develop that skill more and more every day. Well, from where I'm sitting, I'm you're doing it. So keep it up. God bless you, Josh. <laughs> That's a kind compliment. I, I received that. And I love complimenting higher ranking folks too, because I feel like we don't often get to do that. You know what I mean? Um, I learned that when I was an exec for a group commander and I saw what it's like at the top. You know, I saw what it's like behind the scenes. Mm. Um, you know, the tough calls were like, you know, someone made, made a mistake and they had to pay for that. And you don't realize like how much that hurt the person that had to dish that out too, right. Yeah. That, that like that they're not thinking of their family and that they wish that they never made that choice. Like they do, they, there's a lot yeah. of weight there, you know, behind that door. Of course. Of course. And, uh, I saw that uh, her name is Colonel Henderson, Crystal Henderson. She's like. She's a doctor. She's an amazing person. And I was really blessed to be the only enlisted group exec on the base because I I'm, I think it's because I could make her laugh personally, but I don't know. Uh, we just had this. I was a fill in. We had a really good, you know, energy together. And I was a new exec. She was a new group commander. And that's when I learned, like, you know, I, I can I can help, too, from where I'm sitting. Like, you know, just because she, she's still a human being, you know. Um, so I give words of encouragement. I give advice. And uh, ever since then, I, I always make it a point to tell, you know, higher ranking folks what I appreciate about them. I want them to still know that we see that, you know, we don't always get to tell you, but we still see it. Bro, you're extremely kind. I have, um, I admire you for so many reasons other than your great hair. I'm a little bit jealous for that. Hey, ditto you know. on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but learning to be sincere, but to be habitually sincere like you have, um, whether you're on the mic or off the mic or in front of the camera or behind the camera, learning to be habitually sincere is something that I have picked up as a, I've developed an appetite for that because of you. And oh, wow. And if I could become a better version of me, that would be, what I would want to look for is my sincerity. That, hey, sincerity is a superpower. I, I believe that. It just hits different, you know? It really does. This is the longest intro of questions I've ever had. You're very easy to talk to. I knew you would be. Well, well, good. 
the topics you picked, um, I don't know if you remember, you sent this a while back, but it, um, it was emotional intelligence and emotional regulation, sure. leading from neutral, perpetual development, and better to best you. Do you does that sound familiar now? Sounds great. And I got to say, like, you're kind of like a, so you train chiefs, right? Like you run that course when they get selected. I'm, I'm a platform instructor here with um, 10 other chiefs and uh, retired chiefs that are teaching uh, different seminars. We run six different seminars at the same time uh, for a total of uh, 72 chiefs every time we graduate a class. And uh, I, I get to spend time in, in there, you know, bumping and grinding with some of the brightest young minds that the Air Force has to offer. And I'm excited every day just to go in there and grab a cup of coffee and a lesson plan and tear stuff up. Dude, they pay me to talk for six to eight hours a day. I'm taking their money, bro. I'm, I know you're in, you're just loving life right now. It's, it's a great <laughs> gig. It's a great gig. I mean, you're with like the environment is really motivating every day. I mean, every time you got that new, like they're, they're they have to be super excited and, and so happy to, you know, be where they're at in their career. And then you get to like share that joy and help shape their experience going forward. I mean, that must be incredible. Well, I, I find that some, some have um, put it off a little bit longer than they should. Uh, I had one gentleman come through one chief that waited five years and I found that his hunger and his fire had not lessened. Uh, and, you know, stereotypically you think, oh, well, five years are coming here. And that's a little bit late because we're trying to get them at 12 or uh, 12, 15 or 18 months time frame. Um, and then there's just the opposite is some haven't even put on and they're like, you know, teach me if you can. Uh, so it's there, there's a mixture. Uh, and that's what I find fascinating. How do you connect with those that are like, teach me if you can as well as the ones that are here for everything they can squeeze out of the sponge and not leave anybody unfed or unentertained or unmotivated because there's a little bit of entertainment that has to go into it, right? Definitely. Would you say uh, the, the very, very younger end or the very, very older end, which one do you think is a little bit more challenging in your approach? I don't think it has anything to do with with age, I think it has to do with appetite. Um, you know, it's not the rank or the length of the time that they've been wearing the rank. It's it's the, it's the fact whether they're still enjoying wearing their nation's jersey. Uh, do they have a little bit of fire in their belly? Uh, do they see themselves as somebody that can affect change? Uh, and if if those things are are jamming, everything's full up lock. Uh, you know, they're they're full up lock round. Uh, I find that. Sometimes, most of the times, that when they are not able to find themselves in the mission, meaning they don't, they don't know their place yet, um, it takes a little bit of time to just spend a little bit of one-on-one uh, -on -one time to find out what their why is. And once you can figure out their why, you give them the why or what the Air Force needs from them. So you connect their why to the Air Force why, and then, bam, it's off, right? Um, wow. It's it's a, it's a great job. It's a bunch of mental gymnastics, man. You, you know that from being a podcaster. Absolutely. I can only imagine. I would love to like see it one day. Hopefully I can, maybe I can take like a little field trip over there. Yeah, um, I would love to just do like a deep dive on it. Just shadow one of y'all yeah. and just get the full experience. Well, um, that'd be great. You're changing a lot of things at the barn center and uh, uh, our uh, current commander, Colonel Damon Schusel, He's a defender himself. Yeah, he's ready to rip the head off the snake and start anew. So he's he's treating everything like Waffle House. He's scattered, smothering, and covering it. And you know, it's a it's a great time to be here at Maxwell Gunner in the Barn Center doing some PME stuff because we're about to new it up, man. We're that's that's always fun when you get to shake things up. You know, you get to add your special touch to it, and that's sure. needed. I mean, times. Times change faster now. I mean, it's a snowball, right? Like it, it changes fast, you know, um, in a year, a climate could be different of our nation or the service, you know, from whatever happened. And uh, to be able to kind of adapt 
the training to that, that's got to be an exciting time to be there. I I have found that it's uh, it's a wonderful time. I, you know, imposter syndrome is a thing. Uh, you know, I, back in 2016, I put my stripe on as a as a brand new uh, baby chief. And there are times that I've moved into different jobs in various positions, and I felt like, should I really be here? And I have, I have discovered when I shared those emotions that there are other chiefs that also feel that way. And so now there's a kinship. And the, the cloak of, um, of should I feel this way or not feel this way is, is kind of torn in two. And they realize that it, that's okay. And it's okay to feel like you're not quite ready because that means you really want to do a good job. You don't want to dork it up. And so, man, that's really when you find the heart of the lion right there. And I enjoy wow. it. The heart of the lion. I love that. If you start a podcast, you need to call it that. Oh, is that right? Okay. I'll help you set it up. Cool. That's one of my proudest things I'll tell you is I've helped set up countless podcasts and YouTube pages. And, you know, it's just not one of those things where I'm like, hey, I helped with it. You know, I don't need that. I just I just love that I was able to help set those things up. Um, so if you ever need that, you let me know. Dude, I think I'm just going to call you re religiously and let you be my hype man. I could do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be in public affairs uh, or protocol. That's kind of, you know, where I'm what I'm leaning into. So hopefully, eventually, my full time job could be hyping people up and and, sh and showing them the love and, and the way that they want to be seen to the world. You need to bottle it up and call it vitamin J, bro. <laughs> I haven't heard that one, but hey, I might set that up too. Um, okay, I want to go into your first topic here, emotional sure. intelligence and emotional regulation. We kind of spoke on that with my daughter and that story and kids and all that. Um, so clearly it's something that's important to both of us, um, but just curious what your thoughts were on emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. Uh, so emotional intelligence, uh, just up the off the dome, is a buzzword. We hear it a lot but do we really understand it, right? Um, and so we spend a lot of time talking about emotional intelligence. We spend very little time talking about emotional regulation. Emotional intelligence says that I can uh, see or hear or feel an emotion and I can identify it. Where emotional regulation means that I see, hear, or feel the emotion and I respond appropriately. That's true emotional regulation, right? So that means you have to know yourself and you have to know others. And so we've all been around those leaders as well as probably family members that they can identify an emotion. They're emotionally intelligent, but they do not appropriately emotionally regulate, meaning they say the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time, and it doesn't help the situation. It kind of makes that situation go from 50 to 100 in 0.02 seconds. And now you've got to spend all this time putting the toothpaste back in the tube when if you'd have just emotionally regulated, which means slow down, breathe through your nose, maybe take a little bit of a pause before you speak, use some better words because messaging matters, right? Uh, uh, Jay Shetty, he says that, you know, 53% of our emotions or our message is communicated through our nonverbals. 38% uh, of our message is communicated through our tone. So you're looking at about 9% left for just the words. So if we take yeah, the time, true. if we take the time to emotionally regulate, we can have better outcomes. It's, it's not enough to just say, Hey, I'm an emotional intelligent person. You need to be able to emotionally regulate too. And, and here's, a, oh. here's something that we don't take into effect on emotional regulation, right? Uh, we say all the time, these airmen these days, these airmen these days, we fail to take into consideration knowing others, does this airman have a trauma? Well, if they have a trauma, then they potentially have a coping mechanism, how they deal with that trauma. If they have a coping mechanism, then they potentially have an attachment style, which makes them float or gravitate to certain people because that trauma and that coping mechanism feels normal to them even if to us it may look abnormal, but they gravitate to difficult relationships or abusive situations. 
because that's all they have ever known. And to them, that's the kind of love that they are seeking, but they don't know that it's really not a healthy type of love. Uh, and so there's a lot that goes into that. We spent a ton of money back in 2016, 2017 with Brene Brown talking about that uh, with her book, Dare to Lead. Uh, but I think we've kind of forgotten there's a lot more homework that we need to do to be true emotionally intelligent uh, enlisted leaders and uh, key leaders, as well as just a hu good human, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you're right. Emotional intelligence, you hear it. You hear it a lot. And I think it was Brene Brown. At least that's why I know about it. It was because of her. Um, and I think the much harder one to get down, and just for me, is emotional regulation. I'm just going to be honest. Sure. Uh, and um, why well, have ADHD, which those people traditionally have a harder time with dialing that in. Sure. It's like my biggest strength and it could be my biggest weakness, right? It's my strength because I love speaking, connecting, sharing, setting up events, you know, very engaging things. And then the negatives are like, you know, it's hard to do very mediocre tasks, things that aren't really engaging. A lot of the boring stuff that we have to do, you know, that can be challenging. But then the emotional regulation can can be challenging too. Um Again, like I could share joy and be so happy in the moment, but on the flip side, I can go from zero to a hundred if something really sets me off. And I'm not gonna lie, I've I've made some mistakes with that. I'm just gonna be honest. I've had to learn the hard way oh, with yeah. with the regulation. Yeah, and, and and we all do, right, Josh? I mean, you know, we call it a trigger, right? Right. You can't control your trauma. You can't control how you cope or you develop your attachment style, but then you have this trigger over here. The trigger is you, much like the trigger on a, on a firearm, you gotta make a choice to pull it or not pull it. And, and that's a hard thing because I too have a little bit of low key bully in me and I'm, I become a little bit petty when certain words hit my ears and, and I find myself, have, I gotta talk myself off the ledge and self soothe and I'm not still where I need to be on it. I've, I've come a long way. Right. But I'm still not where I need to be. You know, it's a heck of a thing when, you're, when your 26-year-old daughter can tell you, hey, you know, Dad, you've kind of got a lot better at being calm. And I'm like, well, hashtag winning, right? Um, there's, there's a little right. bit of joy in that. And Or right. when, when she also says uh, about a day later, goes, here's their old guy. And you're like, oh, snap. Uh, that, I probably stepped in that one. Right. And what, you know, it, it never does go away, like the working on it. And, and it is because you, there's just different responsibilities, different positions, different types of like, there's just always a different thing you're going to go to. That's sure. going to have its own different challenges. So you always have to be, you know, kind of aware that you're always working on something a little bit. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I realized, you know, with my, I had an uncle who was not a great guy and he put, you know, he put his kids down. He put me down. He just had a way with like being a jerk. Right. Um, and, you know, through lots of, through some therapy and some self-reflection, I've kind of come to the conclusion that when someone makes me feel the way he made me feel when I was young, that's when I really go from zero to 10. So like, that's just a specific thing that, that I'm reacting to. You know what I mean? That might someone else be like, Whoa, Whoa, what the, what, like, what's happening? Like, what did I say? Yeah. Um, that's like, it, you know, a specific, I have to be aware of like when I'm really feeling heated, like, okay, like, do I legitimately need to be heated or am I like feeling a, a kind of way? Cause I'm reminded of something that I really don't appreciate. And and how can I dial this down before I like ruin a relationship? By because words ruin relationships. I mean, they do. Sure, they they do. They can do permanent damage. Um, <laughs> so you, it, it just really helped me to know myself, and you know what specific to me sets me off. I might be overreacting based on my own past versus what the situation dictates. Of course, and and that's you just explained the part that I was uh, I mentioned. That created a trauma with you that has somewhat, somehow wired your coping mechanism to an attachment style that it's created a trigger. So if you, you, like you said, as you learn to hone that 
then you start to do a 180 and you respond differently in those situations. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something else fascinating that I've, I've learned uh, about myself and this might go for a lot of people, but you know, you get, when you get triggered, you do want to retaliate and, and, or by word, you, you want to do something back because you're heated. Mm -hmm. And I really broke that down, you know, talking to a therapist. <clears throat> and what I came to the conclusion of is we're trying to make them feel the way we're feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. you're trying to, you're trying to basically say, Hey, you made me feel X and I'm going to say whatever I can to make you feel X as well. Sure. Isn't that a weird kind of thing? Well, it's a kind of a equal and opposite reaction, right? Right. We're trying to balance the scales because we're looking at it as a competition. Yeah. She just kept asking me questions about someone who did set me off. Yeah. And I kept going through the questions going like, why do you want to do that? Why did you want to say that? Why did you, why, why? And it just got down to, well, cause I felt like this and I wanted them to feel like that. Sure. It was like, it was just like a aha moment. Like, whoa, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, that's weird. You know, I just never thought of it that way until someone really pressed me on it. And I went down that rabbit hole. And imagine, imagine how you feel once you uh, unleash. How do you feel when you reflect on those moments you feel proud or sad or it, it's never it's just like the movies when like the hero kills the villain that they've hated their whole life it mm -hmm. doesn't fix any it doesn't fix anything that they're you know what i mean even the movies know sure. uh it it doesn't help you get better mm. you know you i don't respect that person who did who made that call like the version of me who did that Mm -hmm. I don't respect them more. Maybe in the moment it felt like, you know, I got a punch in. Sure. But in the long run, it doesn't fix you. It doesn't fix the issue and it will happen again yeah. until you find the way to stop that perpetual anger and retaliation. But you also add value to that person. You let them know that they have control over you. You're adding value to what they have done. You reward the negative behavior that they have displayed to you. And so what if you just stopped it? So now you don't add uh, fuel to their fire. You don't put another log on it. You just kind of just, you kind of emotionally de-escalate it yourself. Right. I mean, that's, that's the harder thing to do. It is. I mean, but we have, we have warriors out on the front line doing that every day, right? You know, we have, uh, there's, there's people in, in harm's way right now. It's, and those, those are the people that are really dealing with some trauma because now they're suppressing it. And uh, I'm not making light of mental health. I think mental health is important, but there's some, there's some, there's a lot to be said about learning your own mental health, you know, through research of me, through my me search, so to speak, air quotes. I have learned a lot more about how I make others feel. And uh, I've come to the conclusion I'm not going to make them all feel good. And, and I'm sad for that, but then I can't make myself feel too bad because then that makes me even worse, right? And so there has to be a healthy balance. And uh, sometimes that balance is huh, a counterbalance. You know, taking, making sure I'm okay so that I can ensure that other people are. No, absolutely. There's a lot that could, yeah. Amen. <laughs> Make sure you're okay first. Mm -hmm. Something that's often overlooked. Yeah. Um, and eventually, oh, dang, this thing just gave out. My mic just fell. Eventually, you you wear yourself out, you know, doing that, living that way. Uh, the older you get, the more you, you learn. You have to get yourself dialed in if you ever expect to help someone else get dialed in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've got young warriors. Look at look at what we, we used to recruit. Um, you know, as far as an age group, we were recruiting somewhere between 23 and 27. Now we're recruiting somewhere between uh, 27 and 32. Uh, that's kind of the average. And, and those folks have lived a lot of life and they're coming in with their own version of what life looks like and their own version of what the reward systems look like and their own version of what consequences look like. And yet, 
And General Wells said it best, you can't lead the airmen if you don't know their story. And part of their story is their trauma, their coping mechanisms, their attachment styles, and how they emotionally regulate and emotionally respond. And there's a whole new frontier out there, Josh. And we've got to become is. better leaders of ourselves so we can become better leaders of others. Absolutely. And you know how we have a smaller force now than, let's say, 20 sure. years ago? Sure. I think that's a huge factor, too. Yeah. I remember when I first – I joined July of 2004, and my first base was in Guam. I was aerospace ground equipment at the time. I worked in uh, in like a WRM, like war reserve material age section, so keeping this equipment ready for war. It's in tip-top shape. Uh, but Guam was a cushy assignment for a few reasons. For one, I worked with equipment that's t kept in tip-top shape easy to maintain when it's treated so well it's in like a temperature regulated building and and uh but also there's so many people like there's so many people that the the work just didn't take as much to get done there's it, no. and and you know you kind of just become like a, a fish in this big pond and uh it's really easy to just i mean for people who wanted to separate or leave it just wasn't a big deal what okay whatever there's so many people that you know, we didn't have a lot of the struggles or focus that we need now with much fewer people. When you have fewer people, you really have to like invest more in those around you than like what I saw back when I was an airman. No one even really cared what I was doing or what I was getting into. They just didn't care. Um, but flash forward to now, like you need to know all those people very well. Yeah. But, you know, this, uh, this little box. It's a little box. We're we're more socially connected than ever before, but we are less connected as humans, right? And 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 we say all the time, yeah, they're friends. We're friends with them on our platforms, our social media platforms, but we don't know anything about them, right? And uh, I mean, we we need more connection. We need more social con social connectivity, the connective tissue. We need the the relationships. Right, you know, it, it's we used to build them. We used to teach them in PME. We would have scenarios, and now guess what? We're coming back to with the new three, five, seven hundred, nine hundred um, continuum. We're coming back to that those skill sets, and you're you're going to see us. It's going to take a little bit of time, uh, two to three years, to kind of get that stuff dialed in. But we at the top three tier. We're gonna to have to we're gonna to have to dig a little bit deeper and kind of do some me search and some research and we search and everything to get right. those ready. Or our our airmen will pass us by, and our airmen are wearing OCPs. Our airmen are wearing bars or stars, and our airmen are also wearing a suit, a tie, or a polo shirt. It's all of us. It's all of us trying to get that thing across the fence line. And we need to make sure that we're, we're valuing every person in the tribe, not just select people. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Okay, here's a here's a real interesting one you brought up. Leading from neutral. I've <laughs> never heard that before. And I would love to, to get your thoughts on what that means. Leading from neutral. You know, when you're sitting there listening to a, a discussion in a staff meeting, or you're having a counseling session and you've kind of already, you're like, I've been here before. I know where this is going to go. And you go right to simple. And you're like, I I've done this. I've solved this a hundred times. I've seen this play out. Leading from neutral is just kind of staying where you're at because this particular scenario may have a nuance that you haven't thought of. And so just stay calm. Don't put yourself in gear and pop the clutch too quick. And, you know, do your uh, proverbial burnout, you know, or uh, wait, wait. Uh, you know, you're listening in a meeting and you're not listening. You're just waiting your turn to talk. That's leading from neutral starts from the mind. It's a mental position, not a uh, physical position, so to speak. Isn't it so much easier to just like make a conclusion like right out the gate? Oh, and it, it is. I got to tell you, if you're wrong, there's no worse feeling. 
Yeah. And you know, when I was a new like supervisor, like it happened, I think it happens to everybody, but someone just gives you this story. You're just like, what? My, my your mind is blown. And you're like, well, clearly this person needs paperwork, get them in here. And you're kind of like coming at them. And then, you know, they drop this bomb on this, this truth or this story that you had no idea about. And then you just feel awful. And you're just like, wait, what? Yeah. It's so important to be a neutral, uh, you know, to get all the sides of the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because when someone comes at you with that, they're trying to sell you on their side. They're, they're really trying to sell you on it. Um, and it's really easy, especially if you're, if you're new to, to supervising to fall right into that, that pitfall and just go on their side just because of their energy and the way they're telling you about it. You know, uh, it's happened to me before and it felt terrible. So anytime someone comes to me, they're like, Oh, this person needs paperwork. Like, what do I do? I'm like, the one thing I definitely want to tell you, because I don't know the whole situation, is get all sides of the story first. Like, do not take one person's word for it. Do not. Like, you need to learn a really, and then learn, like, are you missing something about that person, right? Because it's so easy. The easier thing to do is just to give someone paperwork and not really put much thought into it. Mm -hmm. That is the easy, it sounds like the harder thing to do, because we never want to give paperwork, but that's actually the easier thing to do. The harder thing to do is to really ask tough questions and really find the root of like, what is going on with this person? That is actually the harder thing, the more talented thing that you would have to work on to, to find that answer. Of course, of course. And, and because it's hard, you don't want to do it. Uh, you say you did it when a young supervisor, man, I do it. I do it almost all the time. I, I'm I'm reminded of this moment. I ran into this young airman at the shop at, and I'm like, I saw their head down and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? What's happening? You know, you proceed to tell me how they're having financial problems. They've got, they've got uh, relationships issues and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, who's your supervisor? And they told me, and so I'm like, I don't know. I know Sergeant so-and-so no big deal. I said, let me see if I can help you. And I thought, well, you know, chief's going to come in and say today, let me buckle up my cape. Right. Da, 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 da. I found the, found the NCO and the NCO was excited to see me. And they were like, Hey chief, what's going on? And I'm like, I'm my man. I've been looking for you. Really? You've been looking for me. Hey, I want to talk to you about airman so-and-so. And all of a sudden I just saw their posture just change. And I'm like, Oh, there's a bear there. Right. And I'm like, Hey, did you know that such and Airman so-and-so is having, you know, financial problems, relationship issues. This is going on in their life. And they they kind of just went, Roger that, Chief. Roger that. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. This is, this, you know, like I got my cape on. Can't you see my cape? You know, it's Chief. I'm here to help, right? I'm from the government, right? Wasn't having it. And I finally said, I finally took a hard pause. And I remembered that neutral piece. And I said, What's happening? What am I missing? Permission to speak freely. You know, now they're going to click off safe. They're about to click off safe and you're about to get some good radical candor. Right. I've got my own effing problems. Here's what's going on in my life. There's a lot of layers and to this. How do you think I can help them when I can't even help myself? And I'm like, <sighs> I'm like so humbled. I just felt like 500 pounds a weight was put on me and I was in a full squat when I got it, you know, now I got to come up with 500 pounds plus the weight that I went down with. And I just had to apologize. I said, Hey, I'm sorry. And let me help. Thank you. God you caught that. I imagine if that person left, just feeling the weight of the world. Dude, on their think shoulders. about all the times that I didn't catch it. Think about all the times that I had fouled the ball and I had chiefed somebody and didn't mean to chief them, whether it's whomever. And I'm like, okay, that taught me I need to respond from neutral. I right. Stay a little bit calmer. And am I, am I good at it? No. Am I better at it? Yes. So my best is getting better. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you real quick, my story similar to that was when there was a, an airman who kept sending like PII stuff in the hospital to the wrong, to the wrong people with similar names. Mm. Right. 
And like one time is bad, right? Like three times, it's like, this is crazy. What are you doing? Right? Because that, that's just a, in, in our world, that's a, a huge deal. Sure. And that last person had something to say about it, right? Like they wanted blood. They sure. were pissed. Rightfully so. Like this should not be happening. I know it's like on number three, right? Like we're beyond, this isn't a one-off. Like this is the third time. And uh, I had a, a new officer leading, relatively new. And she's like, oh yeah, you got to like hammer up. Like you got to. And I was going to do that. I was like, you're right. And then, you know, we got to stop this, nip this in the bud. And then I was like, you know what? That doesn't match this person's like worth eth work ethic or character at all. Mm -hmm. Like this person's like a shit hot airman. Like there has to be something else that I don't know. So like I kind of went from neutral at that moment. I was like, this something is not adding up here. And you know, when I had that candor conversation and, and made it kind of safe, I'm like, look, this doesn't match anything. I just want to know if there's something I'm missing here. And essentially that person was assaulted at some point in their life mm. and they wanted to pursue justice. Um, I knew a little bit more of the story. It was, it was a pretty bad situation. And she just was carrying this weight this whole time with no one to talk to. Mm. And had I just jumped straight to paperwork, could you imagine what, how that person would have felt? Mm. Not, not only can she not tell anyone, and it's just carrying it on her. Like she's talking with authorities and, and all this stuff. She sure. Now she feels like she can't tell anyone. And yeah. now she's getting punished. So like the trust would have just been right out the window. Yeah. And so that's like two different paths. Like that situation could have went. Yeah. So that it's, was a huge eye opener for me. It's the alternate ending. It's right. the alternate ending to the movie, you know? Um, so many times our airmen are writing their own story, right? And you in the squadron group or wing are watching their their book be built. And so, but you're not reading the book. You're kind of getting a little bit of the movie there, you know, because you're, you're seeing different things. Um, when it comes time to a higher level of leadership to look at that situation, they haven't seen the airmen to understand the book they've written. They don't know the movie they're getting a two minute trailer of what is actually going on in this person's world, civilian officer enlisted. And they're, they're asked to make a decision. And sometimes you just need to pull back a little bit and ask for the alternate endings and the deleted scenes that are on the cutting room floor throughout the squadron group or wing. And, right. and it just takes a little bit of breathing. Absolutely. Just takes that pause sometimes. Um, like, just like you were saying, that ties right back into emotional regulation. Yeah. That's, you know, that's leading from neutral too, right? Being absolutely able to lead yourself. You can't and so both. obviously I won't say, you know, who that person was, but I will say they're doing phenomenal. Like they are absolutely crushing it. Phenomenal person. That's doing, awesome. doing amazing things. So I did want to tell you how it ended. And thankfully, I don't know the alternate ending. We only have the good ending, right? <laughs> thankfully, sure. that's the one we're living with. But yeah. you're right. There was an alternate ending out there that we don't have to to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. But, you know, how many times have, like, like you said, how many times did I miss that? Did I just go in on that person with the knee-jerk reaction and miss something, just completely miss something? Yeah, so. Yeah. I feel bad a lot of times. There's times I reflect and I go, man, how many people's careers did I mess up? And how many people are, you know, as a leader, you're, you're the talk at somebody's dinner table. What are they saying? Mm, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> what they Absolutely. Saying what are they saying? Um, okay. Perpetual development. We, we, we hit on that a lot too, with just random stories that we brought up and, and yeah. kind of how I was saying like different responsibilities, different ranks, different offices, I think drive a perpetual development. I think just life in general and the inconsistency of things that it throws at you, mm -hmm. you have to be, you have to be perpetual. There, there is no finish line of like 
and I thought there was. I'm I'm gonna be completely honest. When I was crushing it in Honor Guard, and I finally felt like I was good at something, I was like, I figured it out. Like yep. I'm killing it, and I'm and that's the only life I'm gonna live from here on out is that's crushing right. it. That's right. I really naively thought that. Yep. And then I and then you get to I got to a different assignment with different challenges and it absolutely kicked my ass it mopped the floor with me yep and <laughs> my ego was here and it was like yep. nothing I, yep. I had to face some hard truths yep. you had to reinvent yourself didn't you right you had to reinvent yourself in order to get yourself out of that cuckoo world that you were living in that clinical that that pristine you know like oh, i can touch this and it turns to gold and then next thing you know you're touching stuff and it's turned into aluminum foil and you're like what's going on and just you gotta gotta reinvent yourself and has that ever happened to you where you were on top of the world on cloud nine and then you went to a new challenge and it absolutely just kicked your butt and you're like whoa what is happening like let send me back to my last base like this isn't cool what is going on yeah i I left Effie Warren and I thought, man, I'm, I'm everything good, great. And the other in 2009, I was one of those number one draft picks to help go stand up global strike. And I got on staff and I thought, man, I'm going to kill this. I know everything there is about security forces training. And then I'm on staff with what? Some other number one draft picks from the right. Air Force inside the security forces world. And I'm thinking, buddy, I don't know a thing about anything i mean you you know like, I, should i be here right now <laughs> well yeah that's exactly right and then you know i uh, i came up for a deployment in 2011 and it hit again i replaced a guy downrange and he was a marine and i'm not a marine and it was like that patrick's Swayze mm. scene at roadhouse everybody kept walking up to me and going you're not a marine well i thought you'd be bigger you know that line Right. I'm like, oh my gosh, I had to reinvent myself. And that's that's the adversity. So you can you can rise to the challenge or you can fall, but if you if you learn to get through it, there's a there's that that growth, you know? Absolutely. And I'll be honest, I, I did fall with that. I did fall. Okay. Um I didn't have the perspective like of what was actually challenging. Yeah. I thought I knew what challenging was. I really didn't know. No. Um, and so I did fall on my face, but I will say I definitely have the perspective now on on what a true challenge and adversity really is. Sure. And and have the have the have the challenging situation stopped coming, Josh? No. They but have not. You can identify them more. Absolutely. You can identify them you can identify them and you identify them quicker and you respond quicker. So therefore you, you don't tend to make the same mistakes that you used to. And, and what we as humans need to learn to do is it's okay to not be okay. Right. You know, you hear our, our leaders talk about it. Okay. Uh, uh, Sim Saf was just here last week with 483 chiefs and she was like, tell them, Hey, get used to being uncomfortable. What got you here won't get you there. And I'm thinking, right on, right on. Let's let's keep on trucking. But if you haven't dealt with adversity, you don't know what to do with it. And that's such a tough lesson that what got you here won't get you there. I remember when when I was at my most frustrated, fed up, and angry, I saw that like it's a book, isn't it? Yes, it is. I saw that cover. I wanted to throw my phone. <laughs> Cause I was like, that's literally what's happening to me. Like I'm trying to do what I did there and it's not working. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely not what's needed here. Um, so that is a, that is a tough pill to swallow. Um, but I'm, I am thankful for, you know, where my head's at now with it, you know, what I've learned from it. Um, and what I've learned about myself, it was all, it was all great information to have on myself and on life. I, I'm telling you, we have to reinvent ourselves. I mean, Tiger Woods, look at Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods' life is a, is ups and downs, but he's reinvented his golf swing seven to nine times. The most challenging one has come after that vehicle accident, right? 
Mm-hmm. And he, when you think of the goats on on the golf course, Tiger's there. You think of Jordan, but nobody thinks of all the shots he misses. They talk about the points he made, or Kobe, or you know, Shaq, or you you pick a all star. We don't talk about all the hours that they had to rechange and redo and retool. Um, even pa- uh, quarterback for Kansas City. He, he's learned from baseball, playing shortstop, how to throw the football while running. The guy, I love the guy. You know, Holmes can kill it, right? And he's still got a lot to learn, which, you know, Brady. Brady was picked mid-draft and didn't get to really start playing. And once he won his first Super Bowl, we forget that all of these champions have had to deal with adversity and reinvent ourselves. Like we just know him as this guy killing it on the field, winning it's Super Bowls. But the there's been embarrassing moments, bad decisions, uh, people trying to not put them in. You know, like who knows what they've had to deal with. But sure. you know what they all have in common is they all they all just show back up. Just show back up, yeah. And that's right. Painful, right? Absolutely. I remember when we were trying to be like the best honor guard in the Air Force. And we like we had a string of like missing a few, which is like a few funerals, which is like the worst thing we could do. Um, because you can't get that back. You know, you can't fix that mistake. Like what's done is done, you screwed it up. And mm. try as you may, it's never gonna be quite as if you were you know, went off without a hitch, right? And that's that's when that lesson hit me. I was like, you we can't be the best if we don't show up. Like, how can we say we're the best when we can't even show up? Like that's step one, show up. That's step one. And that was another one of those like aha moments for me. It's just the power in showing up. There's a lot of strength in getting up every day and, and going back into the fight. Like that is a huge part of it. Yeah. What's what's next step? Do work. Right. Show up, do work. Or do practice for your work. Whatever it is, do your reps and sets. Absolutely. Get busy. Get busy. Yeah. <laughs> What's the rock say? Hardest worker in the room. Right. Okay. Your last topic that you chose here, better to best you. Yeah. When you hear that, what comes to mind? I'm not satisfied with the guy I am. I mean, really? Were you ever satisfied? I thought I was, but I, I, I really didn't know me. I, I thought there was a time um, that, you know, winning a piece of um, hardware or trophy or getting a plaque on stage, you know, I could see it play out in my head like Gladiator and Russell Crowe. You know, I'm in the arena and I'm like, are you not entertained? And, you know, I'm in front of the crowd and they're clapping. And, and I thought I was at my best but I really wasn't. I was kind of empty and hollow and I was full of me. And, uh, and you know, one of those life moments happened that kind of uh, humble you. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a funny thing, you know, growing up on a farm, you know, I always wondered after the harvest, the quickest way to reset the field is to set it on fire. Right? Yeah. I've, I've heard lightning does that naturally, which is, yeah. You would never think that. That's crazy. That's the way Mother Nature re- redoes her forest, right? And the quickest way to get regrowth is to set it on fire. And and those times that I have been set on fire and had been burned to nothing uh, in my in my personal life and my professional life, that's when I really experienced the most growth. And it, there wasn't somebody at the end of that growth spurt that gave me a piece of hardware or, or a trophy or a plaque it was it was the guy looking at me in the mirror going hey dude i love you we dorked that up but it's gonna be okay and um, put a little gel in your hair comb it out look at yourself say hey good morning freedom damn you look good today let's go hashtag get after it and make it a great day and uh, that's kind of been my chant and so let's just do a little bit better let's move the chain get the first down you know, move the chain, advance the ball, get the first down, and get the reset. 
And then if I don't get the reset, let's move the chain tomorrow. And uh, Absolutely. I can't be my own worst enemy. And there's times that I have been. And um, I'm grateful for a lot of people that chant and cheer me on. But boy, I tell you what, there's a lot to be said about loving that person in the mirror. That mirror therapy, if it's off, if that game is off, that mirror therapy is off, the whole world could be for you. If you're against you, and nothing matters. That's the ultimate imposter syndrome right there. That's when it... Uh, that's when you're that's when you're living it every day yes right yes so um i want to i, I did want to ask you something though if you're comfortable sharing you said go ahead. You, you you won you were at a point in your life the pinnacle you won these awards you felt hollow and something happened mm -hmm. and you mentioned that when we first started talking a series of things happened to get you to where you're at today sure. um would you be comfortable like with that specific award story like share what happened that burned you to the ground for that re to need the reharvest, the regrowth. Um, well, it's it's happened twice. Um, you know, I, I had a I had a really challenging deployment in Afghanistan, and um, uh, it was my first time to really do cop stuff. I was teaching Airman Leadership School during 9/11, and um, you know that's when a lot of my peers really learned how to be good warriors and leaders out on the battlefield and. Um, and 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 I kind of got I, I missed that growth opportunity as a career defender and so when I got on staff at Barksdale I ended up with a deployment to Afghanistan and we were leading convoys with uh, with the army and uh, I lost a guy um, the uh, it wasn't a roadside bomb it wasn't uh, you know troops in contact or anything like that it's the the shooters, the local shooters that we had on our team um, snatched up a guy that I was responsible for watching as a force protection uh, NCO, and they took him out and they killed him. And I carried that with me, and I came back home and, you know, tried to reconnect with my wife at the time, and it just wasn't working. So that was divorce number one and I'm, I really fell apart in 2011 2012 2012 time frame and I'm like I can lead convoys in Afghanistan but I can't keep my marriage together what is wrong with me and then I got a 14 year old daughter I got an 11 year old son and they're looking at me like what are you going to do now dad you know your mom and so um I had to become a better version of me, even though I didn't want to. And ran into a guy that said, uh, he said, hey, do you, do you look in the mirror and tell yourself do you love yourself? And I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And he goes, man, he said, you know, I'm not telling you you got to like that guy, but you damn sure better love him. And I'm like, okay. And I started. And, um, you know, uh, I healed along the way and went through that and ended up remarrying. And as luck would have it, I got a little more self-absorbed, uh, you know, somewhere along the way. And, and that marriage fell apart too. And so the, the hype of what everybody sees as being a great career has typically been the times that I have been ablaze in my personal life. Oh, wow. And I have learned to wear the mask of this uniform and I'll put on my military member mask much better than I do my, my chip chatting mask or my, my uh, family member mask. And if I could hit a hard reset and learn to be a better family member than a military member, I would do it today. And so that's that's probably the best, the better part that I'm constantly working on. And uh, that would be what I would encourage others to learn from. You know, Jim Rohn puts it this way. He said, you can learn a lot from your mistakes, but and that makes you smart. You can, smart people learn from their mistakes. Wise people learn from other people's mistakes. So don't make the same mistakes that I did. Uh, don't back into something expensive and uh, – Wearing this nation's jersey is great, but boy, when you can't look at yourself 
in the mirror when you take it off. That's that's really challenging, bro. So wow. I, I just wanted to give you a hug right now if I could. That was like no, no, that was breaking my heart. You know no. what I mean? Yeah, I'm a it, child of divorce. Like so I empathize with you. It's my biggest nightmare. And I am troubled with my marriage some sometimes, certain situations, because mm -hmm. I have all that trauma, right? So like that stuff follows you. Um, and so my my dad, who I respect more than anyone, was you know a career airman through and through, sure. is why I'm here. Um, and his dad before him. Um, so my dad dedicated his whole adult life to the Air Force, active or uh, active duty, full time guard, and as a civilian. And so the man I respect the most, I seen him. I mean, I'll never, I mean, you shared something personal, so I will. The one, the hardest thing I ever had to watch was when he came out the courthouse, he was on his, it was his second wife. My mom being his first wife was like his high school sweetheart. It wasn't as emotionally, he, it was one of those things he thought he had to do versus he wanted to get married. So that one was hard, but it wasn't as hard as the second one, which is a 10 year marriage. They had three daughters together, so I have the three half sisters. And, you know, he came out that courthouse. I was with my uncle Tony, that toxic uncle. He passed away, so I, I'll say his name. Um, I was with him in the car, and my dad came out of the courthouse, and when he got in the car, he just weeped. Mm. He just broke down. Like, he held it together the whole time. I, I never thought it was a getting to him I, or, or I thought he, you know, he was angry. He definitely was angry. Sure. Well, I did this to her and she did that. And, you know, I saw a lot of that, but I never saw him cry. Yeah. And I saw him not just cry, like completely break down and weep. Um, And of course my uncle Tony wasn't any help, right? He's saying all the wrong things because he's just an idiot. Uh, which I wanted to tell him to shut the hell up. Like, I just wanted my dad to like, feel okay. I, you know, and I started crying cause I didn't know what to do. Sure. But to this day, you know, one of my biggest fears is having my kids be that kid in the back seat while I'm breaking down. Like that's one of my biggest fears ever. And, and I am not the best husband. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not like a cheater or a liar or something, you know, the obvious, but I do have baggage and I do handle things poorly because of what I saw as my example. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying every day, I'm being honest, every day to try to be the best husband, father I can so that I, my kids don't end up in that backseat feeling the way I did all those years ago. Yeah. But Josh, I, I would subscribe to you, man, and, and put a lot of weight on this. Um, if you would, please. It's okay to be human. I learned, I learned that my kids will, are okay with seeing me fail if I admit it. And, and I can't not admit it. I can't sweep it under the carpet. I got to stand in the gap and I got to take the ugly and I got to own the ugly because it's all mine. Um, and uh, I mean, there was probably two and a half years that my daughter didn't talk to me. And then when she asked me a question and I was straight up honest and uh, it was that moment that we reconnected and she fell into my arms and I was like, okay, all right, dude, you gotta, you gotta own the ugly. Cause you want to own, everybody wants to own the, the good. It's easy to own the good, but boy, when you dork it up, and you gotta stand there and you gotta own your crap. And it's, and uh, my it just took that one time of, of uh, unfiltered from the heart honesty a painful truth that you had to i'm sure tell her sure. and in that moment yeah out of all out of all that gap of avoidance yeah in that one moment of sincerity brought you together yes so think, isn't that amazing think about, said, think about what you said the gap of what she thought white was so in that gap we always fill that gap with a false narrative we fill that gap with a false narrative, and that's the power of bad, because bad will beat the hell out of good every day of the week, because it's easier to swallow. That's why all the headlines are negative. 
That's why all the clickbait is negative. The power of bad beats the hell out of good all the time. And so if we have a gap or a scene and we don't clearly communicate, somebody that we want to really bring into our circle, they're going to fill that gap or scene with a false narrative. And that's what had happened to her. And I disputed the rumors and it worked. And to me, that's the power of really honest, candid, heartfelt, raw, naked, ugly communication. And, and if you can't learn to get there, not just as a leader, but as a human, you're, you're going to find people that fall away from you. Wow. We had a powerful conversation. This the lot like, I don't want to say like, oh, this is my one of my favorites because, you know, other people might be like, well, hey, man, what about mine? But this was one of my favorite <laughs> interviews I've ever had. Um, I absolutely love talking with you. Um, I think you're an incredible person. Big heart. Thanks, dude. The, the lessons that you shared were not easy to talk about, right? Like, but I think seeing someone at the pinnacle like you are now, like you are training chiefs. Like you're not just a chief. You are training them to be like, that's a huge responsibility that takes a very special person. Mm. And so I think it's so special that you shared all the things, good, bad, and ugly that got you to where you're at today, which shows how human you are and how like there is no perfect path to this end product that I'm looking at now, right? Like there were times in the trenches, there was doubt, but you still made it to where you're at right now. I think that says a lot. And I'm, I just want to thank you for for sharing everything you shared today. And as we wrap up, I just want to leave the floor open to you for any final thoughts that you had. Um, I, I don't know that I'm training chiefs as much as I get trained by about 12 chiefs every time we have a class. They they always come in and they teach me more than I ever give them. Paying attention to my daughter, paying attention to my, my son and, and what they offer uh, you know, and, and trying to learn to be a better mate, so to speak, uh, in my relationship, uh, and and just to love, to love deeper, and to forgive quicker. Uh, I would offer that to anyone as a skill set to work on. And if you can get that L O V E piece right everything falls into place and you don't it, you get so much grace because people will forgive you because they know you came from the right um location in your heart your intentions were pure when our intentions are pure and honorable people forgive you even if they don't like you they will forgive you and i would just say that that's been my piece and but learning to forgive you is probably the biggest thing uh, and I still have a hard time, and I'm challenged every day. I'm, I'm blessed to continue to wear this nation's jersey. Um, um, it has brought me into contact with wonderful humans like you. Um, and, man, I, I, I'm grateful, Josh. I love you, buddy. Um, I'm here for you. I'll throw a rucksack on and run you where you need me. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, incredible person, incredible talk. Uh, thank you so much for just just being you and being open and honest and vulnerable. Um, this is definitely one of the I mean, you had me open it up like that's not supposed like you flipped the script on me. And you had me wanting to open up just because I felt I just felt like it was a great time to talk with someone who cares and is listening. So thank you also for, you know, hearing some of the stuff I've never said on any episode until now. Um, so, I, yeah, thank you so much. So if anyone's still listening, um I just, I just want to encourage you to, you know, really, really let this episode sink in the topics that we hit. And just like chief said, uh, Jim Rome, the Jim Rome quote, you know, let, let other people's stories impact your decision-making too. Don't let it just be about your fails or your trials and tribulations. Listen to what everything we talked about and use that for your life. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here with this talk anyways, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you the shortcut so that you don't fall on your face the same way we did. Yeah. Life hack it. Yeah. This is a life hack, baby. Life hack. I love that. That's another podcast title right there. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. This was the hero's journey of chief 
Chip Chaddock, and we're out. Yes, it's it's a long story. My government name is Travis. Nobody ever uses it. Um, my middle name is Brent, which is what my family calls me. And because I, I tried to do an autocorrect on a master sergeant at F.E. Warren and explain to him, hey, don't call me Travis. But he was in the middle of. He was in the middle of giving me some uh, come to Jesus speak because I'd made a really crappy pot of coffee. And uh, he was calling me Travis, and I uh, I explained to him, I, hey, Travis is just not a name I use. And he says, how about I call you effing Chip because you got a chip on your shoulder, and I'll treat you like you're my three sons, and you'll be Chip for my three sons. And it just, and I felt myself automatically go to parade rest. And so up walks a CGO and says, hey, what's going on? What are you guys fighting about? And he says, Travis doesn't like his name. I'm going to call him Chip. That's where that came from. That's where the nickname came from. I love yeah, that. That's exactly right. What rank were you when that happened? I was an E6. I had just got back into career field from doing PME time. Um, oh, wow. Little so you were like on cloud nine. You were, you were killing the game. You know, when you come back from PME, you're like, hey, you got all these new skills. You're ready to change the world. Josh, I don't, I don't know whether it's a lot of new skills. I, I, I call that kind of a clinical environment. You know, in, in PME or military training or tech school training, you're in a clinical environment. And so all those principles that you have for leadership and manager, management, counseling, coaching, all that stuff works. But when you're released into the wild, you better be a really good practitioner because those principles do not actually land the way they do in a clinical environment. You know, because everybody's there because they have to be there. And right. when you're in your squadron group wing, you pick a place. It creates a there's there's more openness. And uh, and so that's where the power of influence comes into play. You know, the leadership spot leadership is defined as art of influence and directing. That's where art comes in. My two cents for what's worth. Absolutely. It's like uh it becomes like a controlled chaos, you know, in the real world. Like it's not as uh, confined. There's not like a, a defined left and right lane like it was in PME. So it's like the PME is like the foundation. And then when you're out, you know, out and about, you got to tailor it to kind of like your own beliefs, standards, strengths, you know, and, and kind of make it your own special thing. Sure. And, then, and you can't be plastic with it. It will see right through you. Absolutely. Especially the airmen of today. I talk about this all the time. And I think this is why the podcast has been successful today. Cause this wouldn't have always been successful, right? Like 10 years ago, they would have been like, knock it off. Stop. Um, I think it's successful today because they're brought up in the internet age where everyone's lying to them or trying to sell them something from day one. Mm -hmm. So they're, they can spot BS a mile away. Yes. Like yes. now more than ever. So when you have a transparent conversation, like on a podcast, like people are really drawn to that. They want to, they want to know the person, you know, behind the position, like what's their character, who, who you know, where'd they grow up, things like that. Um, and, and in a way it builds trust, you know, just someone listening to it and learning about you. Now they know something about you. Like who, how many people can just sit down with you for an hour and talk? Like that's, you know, as, as much as you would love to do that, you can't do that with everyone who works for you. Well, you're right. Uh, I mean, there's an inclination, there's a drive and a hunger to try to do that. And you want, right. to, uh, uh, you, you want to try to be everything to all people. And sometimes that's where you may fall a little short or pour yourself empty trying to become all things to everyone. And, and that's the beauty of the podcast is that you can just go back and play it and learn all sorts of things. You know, it's not just us talking it's a lot of people in this room listening at the same time so that, that's kind of the beauty of it and you know why i think it's been successful um but as you know or you i hope you know at the beginning of every episode i usually hit someone with like random questions just to shake it up a bit okay i got your topics here i got your bio here but we're going to start with the questions first so we'll start with a, an easy one first here 